Coming up today, defying warnings from the United States and its allies. North Korea says it will launch a rocket in the coming days. China sends its top nuclear envoy to North Korea as Washington seeks strong sanctions on the regime for its recent nuclear test. First President Park Geun-hye says lawmakers must listen to the people's calls and swiftly pass pending bills designed to revitalize the economy and overhaul the labor sector. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Wednesday, February 3rd here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this morning, North Korea has given notice of a forthcoming satellite launch or, as the rest of us call it, a ballistic missile test. The London-based International Maritime Organization says it has been notified of Pyongyang's plans to launch a satellite between February 8th and February 25th. The UN agency says North Korea described the payload as an Earth observation satellite called Gwangmyong Song. The world is concerned as the satellite sits atop a long-range multi-stage rocket that is the equivalent of an intercontinental ballistic missile, ICBM. Experts say the launch would allow the regime to test some of the missile technology needed for a long-range nuclear strike. The launch will add to the global outrage over the nuclear test North Korea carried out on January 6th. Now, in response to North Korea's announcement, the South Korean government has stressed that it is taking necessary measures to deal with the development. A spokesperson for the presidential office of Chong Wa Dae says Seoul is closely monitoring the situation and will respond accordingly. The United States has reacted more strongly. It says any rocket launch under the pretext of a peaceful satellite launch would be a clear provocation. State Department spokesman John Kirby said a launch would violate numerous UN Security Council resolutions by using ballistic missile technology. He said the North's latest announcement further underscores uh, the need for the international community to send the North Koreans a swift, firm message that the regime's disregard for its UN obligations will not be tolerated. Now, China's top nuclear envoy is in Pyongyang. Wu Dawei's surprise visit comes as the rest of the world is attempting to slap more sanctions on North Korea for its nuclear test that happened early last month. I'll Connie Kim with the details. Is China, North Korea's sole ally, trying to play more of a mediator role between Pyongyang and the international community? Anticipation is high that Beijing will do just that during its unexpected visit to the north. North Korea's state-run Korean Central News Agency reported that China's special representative for Korean Peninsula Affairs, U Dawei, arrived in the North Korean capital Tuesday afternoon. The details of Wu's trip have not been revealed, but speculations are swirling. It's gaining extra attention since China is believed to hold a critical role in persuading the North to denuclearize after it garnered international condemnation for conducting a fourth nuclear test in January. Wu is expected to meet with senior North Korean officials, including the representative for denuclearization talks. China has been emphasizing dialogue rather than imposing heavy sanctions on the regime. That's why many North Korean watchers believe a proposal for talks could result from this visit. Pyongyang may discuss a possible return to the six-party talks for a breakthrough with the international community. And since China's been pushing for the resumption of nuclear negotiations, there could be gestures for dialogue. Experts say another possible reason for Wu's visit is to stop North Korea from another provocation. Pyongyang is on close watch as recent satellite imagery suggests it could launch a long-range ballistic missile abruptly, making it difficult for Beijing to side with the North. With North Korea possibly mulling further threatening acts, Beijing may be looking to lend more positive support to the regime before the situation spins out of control. Connie Kim, Arirang News. 
Now, President Park Geun-hye has once again urged lawmakers to quickly pass economy-related bills aimed at helping her administration institute its reform plans, nurture new growth engines and revive the flagging economy. Our presidential office correspondent Song Ji-son reports. At the fifth cabinet meeting of the year, President Park Geun-hye highlighted the importance of the bills pending at the National Assembly, underscoring their role in boosting the economy and improving people's livelihoods. Dozens of bills aimed at revving up the service sector, fostering small and mid-sized companies, and implementing reforms remain pending at the National Assembly, some for years, due to a political standoff between the two main rival parties. 각 정당에서 추구하는 가치가 무엇인지. 어떻게 경제를 살릴 것인지 명확한 해답이 없이 비판을 위한 비판은 결코 국민 경제에 도움이 되지를 않습니다. 국민 경제가 더 나아지고 국민의 삶을 윤택하게 할 대안이 있다면 언제든지 받아들일 준비가 되어 있습니다. She also made note of Seoul's strategy of growth to reform. She pointed to the fact it has been rated as the second best among the G20 members. But said the reason he missed the top spot was because several of the related bills are still stuck in the parliament. She also emphasized the need for deregulation, saying that excessive regulations stand as obstacles to new growth engines, and that it's important to act quickly in this fast-paced era of development. Pointing to a recent security scare at Incheon International Airport, the president also called for full readiness in the emergency and security sectors. Ahead of the upcoming Lunar New Year holiday, or Seollal, which starts this weekend. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. Now, Korea's National Assembly Speaker appears ready to break the stalemate between the ruling and main opposition parties that has paralyzed the Assembly for weeks now. But with the end of the current session and the start of that major national holiday, the Lunar New Year holiday, right around the corner, time is of the essence. Jim Yong-gil reports. Assembly Speaker Chang Yua has been insisting for weeks that he would not use the authority of his position to bring bills up for a vote. But on Tuesday, he changed his mind. I will definitely call a plenary session this week. It will either be on the fourth or the fifth. I will use my authority as Speaker to bring the one-shot bill up for a vote, and it will be passed. The bill is aimed at helping companies that undergo restructuring via deregulation and tax breaks. Tong said he's willing to introduce this particular bill because lawmakers had reached a compromise on it last month. They had been planning to vote on it last Friday, but a last-minute disagreement raised by the opposition over the country's electoral map delayed the plan. The ruling's Henry Party criticized the opposition for breaking their agreement. The Minju Party suddenly reneged on our agreement to vote on the corporate revitalization bill last week. This is a disgrace and a breach of the negotiating rules. The party is more focused on the election than on people's livelihoods. The Minju Party wants the constituency bill passed with the one-shot bill. I urge passage of the redistricting bill first, and then we can vote on other pending bills. This is not a matter of what comes first. It's the parliament's obligation. The ruling party should not criticize us as though we're not concerned about people's livelihoods. The old electoral map expired at the end of last year, and with the parliamentary election in April fast approaching, the issue has taken on greater urgency. The main point of disagreement is over the number of proportional representatives. The Minju Party says it is inappropriate for Chong to introduce the one-shot bill himself, when it believes a compromise can be reached between the rival parties. Kim Young Gil, Arirang News. Now, staying with domestic politics, and businessman turned politician An Chol Su has officially launched his new Liberal Party. An inauguration ceremony was held for the People's Party on Tuesday in Daejeon, south of Seoul, with a general election just over two months away, and has vowed to shake up Korea's long-standing two-party system. Shin Se-min has the details. An Chol Su's People's Party has officially entered the political scene, posing as likely competition for the main opposition. 
At an inauguration ceremony Tuesday, the tycoon turned politician An and independent lawmaker Chen Zhengbei announced they will be jointly leading the new party. We are on a journey to reform politics and taking a path that hasn't been attempted. We will fight against a two party duopoly, and I will stake all that I have on the election. As co chair, An made a public promise to raise the status of the People's Party as the country's third biggest political camp, with hopes of making a mark in the upcoming parliamentary elections. He also reiterated vows to promote reforms, help narrow the income gap, and improve national security to boost public safety. The minor opposition party may have injected some fresh energy into the current stage of politics, but its prospects moving ahead are still foggy. It's entering as a new player with just 71 days until elections, which isn't considered much time to lock down support. And compared to already established parties, it could face challenges in terms of getting its vision to resonate with voters. Currently, the party only has 17 incumbent lawmakers, just shy of three seats of the majority, needed for the party to form its own negotiation group within parliament. A recent survey by local pollster real meter shows the People's Party is likely in for a rough ride, as the approval rating fell to 13 percent, down from 20 two weeks ago. The focus now is whether An and Chun will be able to get out in front to shift the political landscape or even potentially realign the opposition bloc ahead of the general election scheduled for April 13th. Shin Zemin, Arirang News. Now, Korea's consumer price growth sunk back into the 0% range last month, but there seems to be a pretty big discrepancy when it comes to how ordinary people actually feel about prices and the actual numbers themselves. Uh, Huang Jie tells us why. I'm in downtown Seoul, one of the most bustling districts in the capital city with no shortage of restaurants. The store rent in this area shot up over 30 percent in the third quarter last year from a year ago, pushing up costs not only for restaurant owners, but also their customers. So it's no surprise that demand for dining out has remained sluggish on top of a loss of appetite due to the country's feeble recovery momentum. Because of higher rental fees coupled with pricier labor and ingredients, prices on restaurant menus went up over 2 percent last year. This growth is in stark contrast with the overall inflation rate that stood at below 1 percent, explaining why people feel prices are running so high when the actual figures are low. It feels like prices have risen in general, especially food products. A radish cost about half a dollar the day before yesterday, and today, when I went to the supermarket, it was around a dollar and a half. A bundle of green onions was nearly four dollars. Regardless of how people feel about these costs, overall inflation continues to sit low. Statistics Korea said Tuesday prices edged up a mere 0.8 percent last month from a year ago. Prices in the service and agricultural sectors have risen around 2.4 percent, but petroleum products and gas prices affected by plunging global oil prices drove down overall inflation. So while the prices of products linked with oil have dragged down price growth in general, goods and services closely intertwined with people's daily lives climbed significantly more. Experts also say the math and consumer price growth could be done differently. Generally, when calculating the inflation rate, greater weight is given to product groups that consumers spend more money on, so it's price-based. That means the figure could be more reflective of the consumption pattern of those with high incomes. With that, some point out there should be a separate price growth figure for low- and high-income earners to provide a more well-rounded view. Hong Jie, Arirang News. Now, people in the United States might have a slightly better idea of who might be squaring off against each other in next year's 
presidential election after the would-be presidents had their first real test in Iowa. Texas Senator Ted Cruz caused a huge upset by beating Donald Trump in the Midwestern state's Republican caucuses, while Hillary Clinton claimed the narrowest of victories over rival Bernie Sanders. While finishing third in the Republican vote, Florida Senator Marco Rubio far exceeded expectations and may now emerge as the establishment choice. Now, the Iowa caucuses are usually seen as a bellwether for candidates' chances in the upcoming campaign. The next contest is in New Hampshire in less than one week's time. Well, that's all we have for now on this Wednesday morning here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom. Have a wonderful hump day and thank you as always for watching. We do hope to see you at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.